take about 20 minutes or so. Um, everything that I know about <coughs> literature review and some tips of how to conduct it. I know you've all done literature reviews in some case, in some, but probably not as extensive as that one. So that's the final one, that's the big one. Right, first definition of what the literature review is. It's an account of what has been published on a topic by accredited scholars and researchers. It has the purpose to convey what knowledge and ideas have been established on a topic, what their strengths and weaknesses are, and it's a piece of discursive prose, not a just descriptive list of material, <coughs> one piece of literature after another. So it's not a list, tuck, 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 I've read that and that and that, but it's a curse of, of well, discursive prose. That means it's a consistent document that tells a story. It's a part of your research project, and it will, everything you write will not be lost. It will form the basis of your introduction chapter later on. So you basically do work now that already feeds into your final report in May. That's why it's useful. What it does is, it says what your project is all about, what your hypothesis you want to test, and what your research question is. Okay. A good literature review is a synthesis of available research, critical evaluation, appropriate breadth and depth, clarity, consciousness, uses rigorous and consistent methods. Yeah, that's all big words. Um, but how you do that? I want to get, give a few concepts to you that, that hopefully make it clear what, what it is and what it isn't. Um, and what does this should do, besides enlarging your knowledge about the topic, the main purpose of the literature review is that you go and read a lot of the stuff that you're supposed to know a lot about. So in the end, you should become a world expert in a small field, but you should be a real expert in that field. And then, once you've done that, you actually expand that field by going and doing an experiment that nobody else has done before. Okay, so the literature review lets you gain and demonstrate skills in two areas, and that's important, namely one, an information system. <coughs> you will demonstrate that you can read literature and summarize it, but also that you can critically appraise it, so to apply principle of analysis to identify unbiased and valid studies. It means that you read, not only read the studies, but you make your mind up and say, this is a good study, this is not so good study, I take this one more into account than that one. Okay, I've got the definition of critical here because it, it regularly confuses people. The, the main critical word that we use, the word critical that we use in everyday language means inclined to judge severely and find foul fault. But there is a second definition of critical that means characterized by careful exact evaluation and judgment, like a critical reading. And that's what we're after. Yeah? So don't think because something is critical and we use the word critical over and over and over again. That doesn't mean that you criticize people's work, but you read it critically. We're looking for number two, not number one. Just to make that clear. Okay. What should a good literature review do or be? It should group authors who draw similar conclusions. Be organized around and related directly to the research question you are developing. It should synthesize results into a summary of what is and what is not known. So, obviously, you, you, you highlight the, the items that, that are known and that are not known. That would be great. Uh, what I think is very useful is to highlight exemplary studies. So, typically what you start with is a broad overview. You start from the very broad overview and you go to the more specific items. Um, Somewhere in the middle, it's helpful to have a table. I think I say something about the table. I, mean, I, I like tables. Table means you probably have 10 really relevant papers that are really relevant for your, whatever your subject is. And you can make a nice table out of them, saying um, year, name of the study, authors, what did they find, how many subjects did they use, and why was it a good study and why was it a bad study? <coughs> That's basically like an A4 page and gives a great overview over the topic. In most cases, that's useful. In some cases, it's not very useful, but in, in most cases, it actually is. So that's the broad summary, but then what's very helpful is to highlight the exemplary studies, because for all of you, 
there will be two or three studies that are really relevant because you're basically repeating their experiment or um, variating it in, in, in some detail. And these ones you should highlight, you should explain in great detail. So what did they do, how many subjects, what were the actual conditions, and, and, and in, in, in real detail, um, critically review. Most other studies you want to just, well, you want to get the take-home message over but not necessarily all the details. So it's a balance of how much detail you present versus how much <coughs> overview you present. Yes, you want to criticize aspects of methodology of others if, if possible. Here, critical means um, if, if there was a problem with their methodology, then you can highlight it, certainly. You can highlight gaps in research, formulate questions that need further research. You can note areas in which authors are in disagreement if that happens. That sometimes is the case that there are two distinct schools of thought. That's an interesting point because then you need to highlight their point of view and their point of view and critically make your mind up which of these schools you support and what you think is the, um, how to decide which one is right. Show how your study relates to previous studies. Show how your study relates to the literature in general. Okay. That's an awful lot of points. Make it a little bit more um, down to earth what you should do. What, what, how it is written. It is written in a formal and academic style. I think y your literature reviews that you did here, although they are a little bit, well, three papers, it, it's a bit not real, obviously, a bit playful, but I think the style is was very good in all of the ones that I've read here. And this is what is important to keep this scientific style, this academic style. So think about every sentence that you write, what do you want to say? And did you say, did you transport your message? And did you use words that are unnecessary, cut it down to the absolute minimum? Keep it concise, clear, avoid colloquialisms and personal language. You should always aim to objective respectful to other opinions. If you thought somebody was rub or something was rubbish, use words as inconsistent, lacking in areas, or based on false assumptions. Generally, use the present tense for general opinions and theories, and past tense when referring to specific research or experiments. Yeah. And I don't have to talk about that. A avoid plagiarizing your sources, obviously. Just don't do that. Um, how, how you avoid plagiarism, just as a tip, um, if you read a paper, what I always do, you read the paper, you read the abstract, then you read the results probably, you read a bit of the discussion. Um, I try to make notes of every paper, and then when I understand what the paper is about, I write it in my own language. That means that what I've written is definitely not plagiarized. Um, and it gives me the opportunity also to check if I actually understood what that person said, because it's very easy to think that you understand what somebody said, but in reality, you're not quite clear about it. And that's what Marker will pick up on, by the way. If you, if you just copy what somebody said, um, we, we really don't know, because if you just read it, then if I read it, of course you have understood it, because the author has understood it, but I don't know if you have understood it. So if you write it in your own words, it's much easier to, 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 to tell that. That's why it's so important. Right. What are you marked on? Well, if you were marked, there has been times when, when literature review were marked. It's not marked anymore, but I think it's very useful because it actually tells you uh, what we're looking for in a good literature review. Everything here is still important because of obviously your final report will be marked as well using the same guidelines. And your literature review is the introduction chapter. So this is what, 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 what a good literature review should be like. I only go through A because you want to reach an A, of course. So it should be a comprehensive and a critical coverage of relevant up-to-date theory, evidence, ideas to provide insightful, critical and original synthesis and analysis. What are the keywords there? Comprehensive, so you should have all the papers possible, well, as many as you can. Critical, as defined, it should be insightful and, and uh, thorough. Critical original is another thing. It's very easy to, well, not, it's very sorry, it's very difficult to be original. It's very easy to 
um, follow other people's idea just to jot ideas down and what other people have said. It's difficult to be original in that, but being original is a very good thing because that is the way that new ideas have been born. You should give clear evidence of scholarship and understanding of material. This is very easy to reach by just repeating it in your own words. If you get difficult concepts over in your own words, you demonstrate dif um, the scholarship and understanding. Key concept in terms are defined and formed in a useful way. So that means you just use the right language. There is a convincing rationale for inclusion and exclusion of material. That's difficult to achieve and very difficult to judge as well because your markers usually don't really know what is all of the literature that is out there. So it's good to have a rationale for inclusion. So you make clear that you've looked for everything that is there. And exclusion means you don't necessarily look at other aspects of it. The argument is developed in a logical, sophisticated and sequential manner. That's a bit about style. Skillful use of language and scientific conversion, conventions. Imaginative use of cables and figures. So use figures wherever you can. I think this is very useful. But maybe um, don't go overboard with it. Um, but better to say that now. You're technically not allowed to use other people's figures. Okay, for copyright legal and illegal purposes, you are not allowed to copy something from a book into your own work. Why not? Because it is copyright of somebody else. It is, to be totally truthful, not the end of the world, because your project is not an official document, but it is not good style, certainly. So my recommendation is three things. Don't do it but you want to do good figures. So either draw your own figures, which is sometimes easier, sometimes less easy, but if it's an overview of the outer ear and the middle ear, it's easy to draw it yourself. And secondly, you can go to pages on the internet where there is uncopyrighted material, if that is the right English. That's like Wikipedia, for example. So every page will have a copyright message at the bottom and if it says this, this is okay to publish this material you're allowed to but you must make sure that you write in your legend of your table uh, your, 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 your figure where you, the copyright is from the third method is you make a figure your own for data figures that's sometimes useful you copy paste the figure and then you do something with it you draw a cloud around it or you draw some arrows into it and say this is the figure uh, from that book, but I made it my own because I changed it. Sorry. You know, the you know, yes, that's the fourth version. That's the, 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 the most elegant way, probably. You write an email to the author and ask if you're allowed <coughs> to, to use that figure. And my experience is that that is uh, successful in 100% of the cases, but sometimes takes a little bit longer to actually get the permission. Okay, just so you'll be aware. Accurate proofreading, that is something that is absolutely unnecessary. If there's lots of grammatical errors in there, it will bring your mark down because everybody, it's just psychology. You read something and there are lots of mistakes and you can't stop yourself checking in commas everywhere and, and then you, you, your mark drops like a stone, even if the content is fantastic. And so it's just unnecessary. It's very easy to get something proofread accurately, ideally ask somebody else to do it for you, or if you want to, if you're not good at it, but that's an easy way to get your mark very good, because if, 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 if something is accurate, and no mistakes, it will up your mark, independent of what the content is. But that's clear. Pleasing overall layout, okay, that's fine. Research question is developed in a compelling way, and the hypothesis are formulated optimally. I don't really know what that means. It just means you need to have a good research question, but a well-formulated research question, and to formulate your hypothesis in a, re in a good way. Okay. Right. That would be great. Some tips to do it. What do you do in a literature review? First, you identify your papers. How do you do that? You start reading with one, and you go through the literature in, 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 the, in the appendix, or in a book. Um, obviously, that's the broad state. 
and your supervisor will help you with that hopefully, give you some papers to start with or some internet pages to start with. Um, second, you read the key papers, so you identify the key papers and read them in detail. And I guess that you don't have to read hundreds of papers, you have to read tens of papers, 10, 20 key papers are the ones that you really have to read and understand. Don't, don't cite me on that, it's different for everybody obviously, sometimes there are less, sometimes there are more, but I, I don't think it is necessary for anyone to read 50 papers in detail, it's probably impossible as well. Many literature reviews cover quite a range of literature sources, but only the better ones go to the second stage, beyond the conclusions described to review the key papers critically. I think less than 10 papers will be actually really explained, will be the key. And then there are something like 50 papers that you reference, but you might have only read the abstract of them. That's perfectly reasonable. So, description of key papers is usually better if it includes selected figure or table from the original paper and convey the results sometimes. Yes, balance of evidence is often assisted by a table. That's what I mean. You can not necessarily balance, but an overview of the, of the research field is, is well assisted by a table. If you read one paper, what do you do? How do you read it? You, read it, you should ask yourself some questions with it. Namely, have the authors formulated a research question? You would be surprised how few papers that actually do appropriately. I think half of the paper out there struggle with their own research question, um, which is something you can criticize them on. But you, you want to look out for that because if their research question relates to your research question, it's important. Have the authors evaluated the literature relevant to the problem? Do the authors include literature taking positions he or he does not agree with? That's difficult to know for you because you need to have a complete overview of the literature to know that there are actually these positions. But if so, most people will not include these contradictory positions because people, as the confirmation bias, they try to transport their own idea and they're not very often not necessarily looking into the contrary evidence. That's very easy, not very easy, but that's a good starting point for a critical review to see that people actually don't take other people's opinion into account. How good are the basic components of the study design? So validities. What way does the article contribute to the understanding? In what ways is it useful? What are strengths and limitations? Usually they talk about that very well. So they, they discuss, hopefully, their own um, strengths and weaknesses about the internal and external validity. Yes. Is or how is the article related to the specific thesis or question you're developing? If it isn't related, throw it away immediately. Usually you know that after the abstract, hopefully. If it is related, put it on one pile and well, read it immediately or wait for it for later. Um, don't get too broad, is my recommendation. Right. The structure. The overall structure of your review will largely depend on your own thesis or research area. Well, yes, fair enough. But what you, what you should do is to group together and compare and contrast the varying opinions of different writers on certain topics. Right. You should group together the opinions of different writers and you shouldn't group together different papers. Right, what you sh must, must not do is just describe what one writer says, then to the next writer, and to the next writer, and the next writer. That's just a list of literature. I've read this paper, and they say that. And then I read this paper, and they say that. That's not a good style. You should, the, the structure should be informed, dictated by areas, not by writers, or by controversial issues or by questions to which there are varying approaches and theories. Within each of these sections, you can then discuss what the different literature argues. So what is the, um, what, what are the different authors saying on that? Okay, so don't structure it by paper, structure it by topic. Some formalities, there is no official word limit. There have been some, but I don't think they are very necessary to give. 
Um, the, better to count references. This is for me to tell you that what, what I judge the literature review on is not its thickness, but there is a high correlation between the mark of a literature review and the number of references that are in the back quite often. That doesn't mean that you put hundreds and hundreds of them, please. You, you, you need to read the references. You should never put a reference in there that you at least have read the extract of, obviously. Um, but it is no use, no use for us to give you a, a word limit or a minimum word limit, but we expect something like 20 to 30 pages, and we expect something like 50 references in there. Okay? Not definite, but this is a guideline. I try to give you an informed Inter intelligent guideline here and not a firm rule. There's, there's no point in We're not trying to make you do some work according to the guidelines and the formalities. We're trying to get you into a research topic where you become an expert. And how you do that is up to you. There are a number of ways. This is something that is on average maybe the case. That's just a literature review. Does it sound a lot? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about 12 points, one and a half lines, line spacing. Everything I said last time is, of course, true for the literature review as well, yeah? You've got three months to do that. <laughs> that does include the reference. No. Yeah. Right. How do you finish the literature review? And this is the difficult. This is the, 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 the end of the review. You should you should have a summary of what the review just did. Okay, what you just said, maybe a page, and this should lead to the research question. That's the most difficult bits of it all. Nobody here starts with a well-formulated research question. I assume. If you do, you're very lucky. Usually, it, uh, from the practice, if we have PhD students here. You know that PhD takes three years. They develop their research question usually after a year and a half. That's how difficult it is to actually develop a research question, to formulate a research question. So if I asked you to formulate it here at the end of the literature review, it's a big task. But you can try it at least. So a succinct research question, what do you actually, why are you there? What do you want to do? That would be good. You can try that. Okay? Don't, don't, you're not marked on it. So try and it helps you to, to clarify your mind. That should lead to an hypothesis then, obviously. What are you actually trying to find out? Okay, that was it. Have I got anything else? Nope. Are there any more questions? Everybody happy with the project? Hope so. I would recommend that you make an appointment with your supervisor this week so that you get into, into the motions, get some papers maybe, and find out what you're actually doing. Otherwise, you can do whatever you want.